purchase switch computers midstream. All right. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to Talks, Talks on Computer Systems. I'm Martin Gris, Director of the campus. Uh, we run this talk series on various aspects of computing systems uh, almost every Tuesday. Uh, typically, we record this information. It's available on the web. Today, we're having some technical problems, of course. Um, but uh, we'll attach the slides later to the web for those who couldn't see them, and we'll try and keep the video camera on the slides most of the time, although there's some moments when we have to move the camera onto the things that our speaker will show. So um, I would like to introduce the speaker, Dr. Randy Smith. He's a research engineer at, was at Sun Labs, now Oracle Labs. He's been a principal investigator in a number of areas. The ones I know most well are sunspots, which uh, he'll tell us about. Uh, he also worked on uh, 2D visualization, uh, worked on a language called Self, which is rather interesting if you want to see how languages work. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Randy Smith, who will tell us everything he wants to tell us. Thank Great. you. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks for inviting me to be here. I'm sorry about the technical problems for remote people, but uh, this presentation will be available later, and I hope you'll be able to figure out a lot of it. Um, Ted asked me to come, and I guess that day I was feeling old, so I decided to look back at my career, and this is what I will kind of be using as a framework for my talk. Um, I've worked in uh, several different areas. As Martin mentioned, uh, computer languages, uh, u tools, UI frameworks, and stuff like that, and in education. And the timeline of my career looks kind of like this. It, it uh, makes these little excursions around from time to time, but I've always been interested. Basically, what do these have in common? It's things to help you build things. Uh, the ones on the left and bottom are things in the external world. And the one in the right is things inside of you. And I, that means that you have to have a way to make things clear and help people construct stuff for themselves, for their own purposes. And so I, I thought it would be interesting to just focus on those excursions into there and try to make a story about it as well as we go along, that from which maybe things no, will line up in an interesting way for you. Um, so uh, looking back at history, um, and this is very crude, but the basic idea is going to be way back in the 80s. Um, remember computers? And, and there was like a lot of text as the way it communicated to us. And my claim is going to be this has like a very dominant role in way, the way we conceive about the purposes of computers and the way we conceive about the purposes of computers in, in education particularly. Now, computers, of course, could do graphics very early, but, but what I mean about graphics is part of the sense-respond uh, cycle that animals like us have in the world. So I want, the, I want graphics to evoke for you this, also this idea that there are things on the screen that you can grab an effect and that you're all included as part of a world, not just pictures, which you could do early. Um, later, can you know, later on, computers, we all got connected to each other. And it's really cool now to Skype with your friends in Europe or family or abroad, whatever. And eventually, we get to embedded systems. And the point is going to be that each of these relate to you in a particular way. Text is a, a denotational medium. A word of text stands for something in the world. And it's sort of all about ideas. And that colors the way we think about what computers do. And so it's natural that the first kind of model we have for a computer is a tutor. And if you think back to those very early days, um, and in fact, there is research started way back in the 60s about what computers could do, but they're all about how we can guide the learner, how we, the ideas that the computer is figuring out what's wrong with the student's thinking and trying to give them guidance on their thoughts and stuff. It's very much like a tutor, and that was what we were thinking about. And some of you may know there's a this system called Plato that's kind of uh, goes way back even before uh, 81 and earlier systems, as I say, than that. Um, but a lot of them are, are quite similar to this model of trying to specialize instruction for the person based on this model of a tutor. 
Um, now, of course, interactive graphics go back in experimental modes way back. I mean, I just uh, saw Ivan Sutherland yesterday. He came by and visited the labs. He was doing augmented virtual reality way back in the 60s, right? With this thing that you could like walk around a map of the United States in 3D in this room. It's really cool. But it didn't really become available enough until later. And when graphics became available, that sort of opened up this idea of a world that you could make within the computer. There are things you could grab and touch and all of that. And that relates to you and your sensorium. So we've kind of moved from the brain and now we're leaking out into your fingers and eyes and ears and stuff like that. And uh, this whole idea of microworlds became possible to build and to work with. Um, and that's where I'm going to talk about one of the systems I built uh, called the Alternate Reality Kit. Uh, just ARC for short, and that was when I was at Xerox Park in the mid-80s. It's on top of the language Smalltalk, an interesting language I recommend to you. Everything is in an object, and it's dynamic, and it's very pure. And I'm just going to play this video now that I made, and you could tell it's a long time ago, Fire because I look really young. <laughs> and even carry them between worlds. These two objects shown here are special objects called interactors that represent some interaction law of the environment, such as motion or the law of gravity. For example, if I start an object moving, remove the law of motion from the world, I can carry it over to the other one and introduce the law of motion here. The user communicates to objects by pressing buttons. For example, by turning on the law of gravity here, I can start a gravitational attraction going between this moon and the planet. Users can playfully throw any object around so they can try to discover different kinds of orbits that are available. They print numerical values. I've kind of edited this for presentation just to get through it. And now this is attached and ready to be pressed. We've changed the value g inside the gravity law. And because buttons are themselves physical objects, they respond to other buttons. I happen to have already created a toggle permasend button here. That puts the button to permasend mode, which means that the numerical value is continuously relayed into the button and down through into the law of gravity. The use of animation indicates that things are active. The plug is continuously relaying the value here, the button continuously relaying it the value into the law of gravity. For example, if I drop that out of no man's land, the button stops relaying things because it's not attached to anything. We can play with our modified law of gravity and try even negative values and see what would happen if Newton's universal constant of gravity were negative and positive and generally interact with a way that's completely impossible in the physical world, with which you can discover the role of this constant of gravity, discover what it does in the universe. Arc object. It's a simple rectangle with simple physical attributes. And do a little bit of graphics with a marker object. Marker is like a primitive little piece of coal that can be dropped on something and will leave a mark. We can send messages to these markers, such as getting it to become slightly larger by giving it a grow message. It's a little bit bigger there. And let's uh, get a copy of that. Tell the copy to uh, change its color. The arc marker change color. And that turns it into white, I believe. Whoops, come back here. Okay. All right. And uh, in fact, let me make a copy of that and create even a larger marker that we could use as an eraser. In 85, this is all very weird. It's still oh, slightly it's weird. Made, uh, <laughs> quite sizable. One more here. Let's change its color so it becomes a nice neutral shade of gray. All right. 
And this can be used sort of like a brush to uh, wipe out the whole surface. Now, because the markers are physical objects, we can introduce an interaction between them. Let's get a spring force. The spring force will not automatically enroll all the objects in the reality into it. That would be a real nuisance to have everything connected to each other by springs. So we have to explicitly enroll the markers. Put them a little farther apart. Enroll the black marker. And now they're interacting with each other as though there's a spring between them. And this is an easy way to create a strip chart recorder. ARC is a natural for physics teaching applications. In this example, a bubble chamber was simulated. Users have control over the speed of light and other more mundane variables. A bubble chamber is a device that reveals tracks of elementary particles. These particles are simulated by specializing marker objects. An electric charge attribute was added to the markers, and they were given relativistic rules of motion. The modified markers were then shrunk down to a very small size. This application is an experiment in giving students the ability to violate conservation of energy and conservation momentum in order to give them a way to learn about those laws. Suppose the user wished to create a new kind of interaction, a force of friction that's not currently found in the warehouse, for example. We'll start by asking an object's for its velocity, which is displayed here. The resulting vector is accessible with the message menu button, and we can do arithmetic with it. We're going to try to multiply it by a negative number to create a vector that points in the opposite direction to the direction of motion of the object. The resulting vector will be added in as a force acting on this large marker. And we should have a combination of buttons that acts as though there was a uh, frictional force. We can try it out by throwing the object, pressing the button. And as you can see, the size of the vector components uh, OK, what we want to do now is combine all these buttons into a brand new button, one that isn't found anywhere in the world. I had to go make it uh, character by character in the uh, warehouse. A friction button with one parameter. The parameter will be the small negative number over here, so that that could be a changeable uh, attribute for the friction message. We're going to tell this new button to swallow this combination of buttons over here so that it will act in a way uh, equivalent to that combination. And uh, here's our resulting uh, friction message. It should act to slow the object down. Uh, in this way, though, we can only get friction acting on this one object. What we'd like to do is convert this button into an interactor that is promoted to a law of nature. There's a message here that will do that. Again, I'm indicating to the object to uh, save the numerical value over there as a parameter. The button is then converted into an interactor, and we can now have it act on many objects at once, not just this pen, which will be slowing down, but by explicitly adding in our white marker up here, and the black marker. We can now do a lab with damped harmonic motion. I'll do the strip chart recorder trick again. And wait till the markers get on, on the paper. And turn on the spring force. And you can see that the peaks in the oscillation are exponentially damped due to the presence of friction. user may wish to include. Ideally, users will come to forget that what they're watching is merely a video image. Thanks for watching.
Okay. So um, the ideas that were in there, um, I still don't think they're like fully incorporated, but perhaps for some good reasons, I don't know. But the idea of taking a physical metaphor, applying it to everything, every object on the screen there had mass. Um, because these buttons, which were small talk messages, and what I was doing was like reifying the semantics of the entire small talk environment. So that's why I got everything to automatically appear as some sort of box on the screen. Uh, including these buttons, though, and so it was interesting that because they're things that you could talk to them, and that lets you program what they do, uh, combine them in different ways, activate them continuously, and so on. And another one of the themes here is making these abstractions into tangible things so that uh, you, could, you could control them and learn about alternate realities as a way to learn about the physical world. One of the bummers about the physical world is it's just fixed here, and it's really hard to learn you know, appreciate what we've got by sort of taking it away and seeing what, what's different. So that was one of the interesting ideas in terms of research that we did on learning was to tell, take these objects and throw them around. These are hockey pucks sliding over frictionless ice and they bump into each other. And there are these different worlds that you could choose from. One of the questions was, can students recognize a non-real world anyway, one where a violation of uh, conservation momentum and conservation energy uh, are, are at play, rather than uh, the way the one we are, where the, those are saved before and after a collision. So we did an experiment in which uh, we created six worlds that differed in the degree to which momentum and energy uh, conservation is violated. And you can see the real world is over there at zero, zero. And, uh, we asked students to rate on a Likert scale each world from weird, you know, up to completely normal. And you can see that the, it does look good that students can recognize the real world pretty much uh, compared to uh, these others, although it looks like there's a value rising out there. So maybe there's like a false real world way, way, way down there. Who knows? We did uh, another experiment where we had a let students try to tune these parameters that violate energy and momentum conservation and see if they could kind of reconstruct the world. These are psychological terms, recognition, reconstruction. Reconstruction is a little harder. They've got to explore all this uh, continuous parameter space of A and B. A uh, violated energy and B violated momentum conservation. And um, here's where we asked people to set the sliders and you could see that well, so they, did, they actually did pretty well, but there's a couple people that were like <laughs> kind of confused about things, obviously. Um, so that part worked well. Um, uh, in informal measures, though, I was hoping that we could ask students, okay, what's wrong with these worlds? What is wrong with the world? And that they could say, well, there's like this forward impetus, you know, and that's got to be like conserved before and after a collision. And yeah, that's what it is, you know, that they would discover on their own the ideas uh, that, of conservation laws. Um, that didn't work out so well, unfortunately, but at least we have the, the ability of them to recognize that, that sort of stuff. Okay, I'm going to move on in, in history. Um, we get now become connection. Of course, there's experiments and people remotely connected via computer networks going way, way back in time, but they didn't become wa really broadly available until later. And um, this enables a new kind of model called distance learning. Now distance learning is a very broad term. I got to apologize for, for using it. In fact, it goes way back. People used to learn by mail. You could get courses by mail and stuff like that. And um, to my mind, getting something in the mail and learning it uh, as in your hand is not distance learning any more than like having the school built from lumber from far away and then you go there and learn, you know, that, that, you know, where the thing came from. It's more like the learning process itself involves distance and that's what I, I'm talking about. Um, and, and I don't count by that things that are recorded and delivered to you any more than by mail or by, te by television or anything. Um, but we could actually start to get real-time interaction in the learning process over, over a distance. And so this involves um, a system I built called Kansas, which is the actual user interface for the self-programming language that Martin mentioned that I'd worked on earlier. And um, this is a picture of Kansas. Uh, again, you'll recognize it has a feel of the alternate reality kit about it, and that's because kind of the, the semantics of the language self came from that project. 
uh, but we took it to the nth degree and uh, had a lot of very clever people working on it over the years. What you see here is a small portion of Kansas, which goes off millions of miles in all directions, almost all of it blank, of course. But you see three screens. Two are overlapping on the left, and they include video images of, of two people at their computers. And one guy is there off on the right. That's my pal, Ron. And he's working away on something. Um, again, this, all this stuff has this property that you can reprogram it dynamically as it's running. Um, and in addition, you could take the user interface apart. You could pry buttons off. You could pry these things off and reassemble them in, in different ways. And I'll show a little video about that. And I'm going to sort of dynamically uh, run through the video so we don't, because I'm worried about it. The name Kansas is inspired because, you know, there's some people out there in a flat area. Um, in those days, yeah, the video was not like over the net Skype we have now. This is like kind of specialized video cards and stuff. So um, I'm going to kind of skip around here and show various parts. So um, uh, I'm going to connect with my friend. For Kansas too. So let me go to this copied uh, video element and uh, modify this language level representation. I'm going to send a uh, message channel down. I can either evaluate that right here or make it into a button. There, I can send any arbitrary message that way. Hi, Ron. Great. So here we are, Ron and I. And uh, uh, Ron, you're going to go on and add more controls uh, there. And uh, he'll start. Right. He'll start building up a little application. I'm going to uh, select my object and ask it to start following me because we're going on a tour of the this large space. In the radar view here, you can see there's uh, bounds of the screen for Ron and me. But in fact, we can go out to visit some of these other other objects. Now I can press these navigation buttons and go on that journey. My window will start following me around. I went down. I'm now going to go to the right, get out of Ron's way. You can hear that the music's faded in the background. If we go back, it'll slow up in volume. That's because this object here is a CD player. And when we move away from it, it drops off in volume. Ron's voice drops off in volume, too. Can you hear me, Ron, still? OK, so you can see he's quite far away. So we'll, uh, adjacent working groups can uh, remain mainly uh, acoustically isolated, but uh, but call out for help or something like that. Let's look at this idea of gas simulation. Here's the language level view of that. Again, any, this is the message interface to it, so we can send a message uh, or just create a button to send it if we want. The emphasis here is to try to diminish the distance between the language and the user interface. We'll get a one-to-one -one correspondence between all these messages we can send to objects and uh, the, uh, the buttons that a user would employ to activate them. So you can imagine a physics kit, which we have in here, that would let you. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip around because we just sort of build up a little interface for Ron's video image. Uh, here's a, we play a videotape in there okay. of some students that we work so, with. Uh, we're here in Mountain View, uh, operating over the open internet. We've uh, worked with these uh, students in East San Jose. And you can see they're sitting at uh, several sites, several workstations. Uh, 16 miles away, and they will be spread across this vast surface of Kansas, each with their own simulation. Okay, I'm just going to skip ahead. That was pretty cool. We got to work with these students in East San Jose learning uh, physics through these simulations, and they were all spread out on just different parts of this giant, vast space. Um, and then uh, Ron's built up a little couple buttons there. And it doesn't have a frame around it to connect his video image to the two buttons that change the channel. By uh, taking it apart. So I'm going to go in here and rip out this panel, uh, which has a nice purple frame around it, and uh, get, get rid of that and use uh, this frame uh, to stick Ron's image in. 
and the uh, uh, pan the uh, row of buttons would also get stuck down in there. So now we've got a nice frame around Ron. Okay, Ron, let's uh, have a final demonstration go down in the basement uh, and illustrate the user capabilities that, that we've been working with. Uh, let me get a copy of this before we run off so that I can navigate as well. Okay, down we go. And uh, here comes Ron. We both arrived down here in the basement. And what we've got here is the representation of user capabilities, kind of a palette of these capabilities. And this turns out to be very useful because with high school students uh, tending to want to press everything they see, they can send the system off into weird states, uh, especially when there are lots of them. It's hard to keep track of who's where. So uh, this is... Uh, Ron's set of capabilities, and this is my set of capabilities. Each of us uh, has a name and a machine and the ability to do different tasks. And to illustrate how this works, you can just drag out, for example, the ability for Ron to press a button. I can remove that. And now, uh, you beat me to it. Uh, try, try to change it. <laughs> OK, I'll uh, send the channel down, but uh, he wouldn't be able to do it because I removed the ability for him to press buttons. As a matter of fact, I can remove the ability for him to even grab objects. And uh, he's completely, I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, in a, a strange self-referential way, I can grab the object that lets me grab objects and remove my own ability to grab objects. And now, uh, well, it's a good time to end the demo because there's not much either of us can do any work. <laughs> All right, so, oops, hit the wrong button. So uh, one of the principles that underlies the design of that space that I think is important and may still not be uh, appreciated in collaborative system design is what I call whizzy witties. Now, anybody guess how to expand that acronym? What you see is what I think you see. Yeah, right. Yeah, what you see, very good, okay? Indeed, what you see is what I think you see. There are these two guys there. And it's what happens in the real world, think about it, people often try to make these collaborative systems. Everybody sees exactly the same thing. But notice, this seems to be working pretty well, and I could see you, but you, you know, I see something completely different than you. But, you know, you know I can see the screen. I could tell you could see the screen. I have a model that is in my head that not only that you are there, but I have a model of what, you're experiencing. And I think those bubbles go off recursively to infinity. So that's a nice feature of the real world, and it's often often neglected. Uh, we did some interesting distance learning research at Sun Labs with this system, um, and uh, I wanted to tell you about it. And this is an example of what, you know, again, it's this new capability of connections enabling us to do kind of research that would be difficult before. So imagine an axis that compares lecture-based method with collaborative learning. And you could be either co-present or distributed in each case. So here's the conventional lecture. The people in the building here are, are going through that right now. And of course, there's network and satellite distribution. And some people may be out there as far as I don't know, sort of violating whizzy witties. I think there's some people out there. Um, and uh, we know uh, that a very popular way of learning is small group study that can be co-present. And we're thinking also now about distributed small group study, which could be supported over, over distance. So if you compare grades, there's a lot of studies that show basically that that works pretty well. That if you compare the course grades of students at this kind of speed, that sort of conventional wisdom is that. And there's a lot of effort that's shown that small group study can be an improvement. So the question was, what about this? And we were going to try to compare uh, co-present collaborative learning with distributed small group study. And the particular form we're using is a, a special thing called tutored video instruction. And uh, we're going to compare it with distributed tutored video instruction. So TVI versus DTVI and see how the grades compare. 
And what is TDI? Well, students sit around in the conference room table. They sit there and they watch a videotape that's playing in there. And there's a facilitator, which is the word tutor, but it's such an old technology. They didn't have the word facilitator, I think, in those days. And he's sort of in charge of stopping and starting the tape and, and marshalling, make sure that everything's going forward. He's not really a domain expert. Uh, he's familiar with the course, but not, not a super expert. And of course, the lecture is only there on tape. And the DTVI thing, well, here's uh, one of the embodiments of it, which has a videotape there in the middle of a lecture, and all these students there, and they're all wearing headsets, they can all just talk into a common audio space. And I've, I've used Kansas here to augment it, so you can see all the flying curses around with the names on it, and people can drop in notes, and they could collaboratively type and stuff and make notes. Then in the evening, the uh, lecture comes by and can see the notes and leave comments about their outlines of the lecture. So. That was actually pretty cool. And then this was up at Chico, uh, and I was down here in the Bay Area, and I could go visit them and like debug problems and be off on the side. So it was all a really cool thing. The DTVI study uh, involved over a thousand students, uh, split in three conditions. We include the lecture amongst that: a conventional TVI and DTVI. And of course, we like tons of videotape that we analyzed and all of that. So some of the observations. Um, based on about 3,000 uh, conversations. I can't, can't remember now what the unit of a conversation is. Um, but one of the things we noticed, and because the statistics are so good with this many students, you could actually have like small differences statistically assessed as, as being significantly, significantly uh, significant, insignificant differences. Like not that much humor, but some. Uh, individual remarks tend to be a little shorter in DTVI for some reason. Um, facilitators seem to be a little more active, possibly a sense of distance there that had to be overcome. Um, but basically, it's very similar. Um, I think one of the things that's going on there is we had a shared acoustic space, whereas when you're at a table, you can address somebody on the side. So you could, you could just say something briefly to, to somebody and have these side conversations. And so that's not supported in the interestingly uh, everything is in the shared thing. That's a significant difference. Um, but the percentage contribution of individuals, the amount of content-based discussion versus, hey, how about them Niners? And uh, the number and length of conversation. And of course, the big question is, how did the great outcomes come out? On DTVI versus TVI versus lecture. And they uh, were Basically the same for those two conditions, and again, both the, the, the lecture students. But what do you think is going on there? For me, I think what it was in retrospect, and we didn't have any kind of metric for this, but when you're with a group of people and you're going to be talking about the course material, I think at night you're more likely to reach up and take that biology textbook off the shelf and study it, just because you're part of a peer group. Whereas when you're in a lecture, it's really even though you're elbow to elbow with other people, it's kind of an isolating, you know, experience. You know, you're not, what, what, you know, it's not really what it might seem. So this is uh, this is our answer that yes, distributed small group study can be as effective as uh, co-present small groups. Um, and this is this sort of stuff is now going on. I just got uh, borrowed this slide from my friend Tim O'Shea, who's head of Edinburgh University. And that's him uh, live at the time, uh, granting degrees to graduates of Edinburgh University. And uh, of course, they're all this is all being done in Second Life. And uh, you could see some of the graduates assembled there. And friends gathered to watch the ceremony in Second Life. Um, some of them doing unlikely exercises. I don't know. That's what Second Life is like, a little weird. And you, when at the time comes, you walk up on the stage, and I don't know how Tim reaches through the window there, but essentially that's that. And confusingly, uh, at this most recent graduation, one of these people with an avatar was also out there on the stage and went up and got with her device, I don't know what it was, an iPad or something, had her avatar walk up with her and she was in two places at once, and now they're confused whether they might have accidentally degreed, or granted two degrees to one person, but at any rate, that's, that actually happened the last time. Um, and uh, now, finally, I'm going to talk about embedded 
systems, which is like our computers, have started to sink into everyday physical objects. And uh, these relate to the world, the world around us. And that uh, gives us the ability to have programmable reality is the way I like to think about it. Um, if you look at the world up close, it's kind of interesting. It's covered with a thin layer of people on the land parts. And it's also covered with a bunch of computing resources that are connected by networks. And it's interesting the way that that thin layer of network relates to the thin layer of people is through those things with screens and keyboards. Like that thin layer network kind of emits light out of that screen. It goes into our wetware, twitches it around up there, and our fingers go back and bang on little plastic rectangles. So we have this interaction loop that includes humans and the network. But it doesn't include the physical world that gets excluded. And now we're starting to move away from that. And I'd say that's a new thing. And I'm going to talk about the sunspots. And here in the front row is Roger, who headed the sunspot project for many years. Uh, I'm not working on it anymore. He isn't working on it anymore. But sunspots continue, and they're still in use at, here at CMU. Uh, it's a, a, a small device, and I have one right here. Um, that uh, has uh, three layers, battery, processor board, and a sensor board. Uh, it's got some sensors on it and the ability to control external lines, and you program it all in Java. And I know there's a lot of people here that are used to that. It's actually been used for a lot of places for a lot of different projects. And uh, I'll just quickly show some. This is a balloon launch that was going on. This is an art project in downtown San Jose. The user at the bottom there is aiming a laser scope to poke at a window, and it lights up blue light in this case in that window, and that light spills across and comes down towards you. Just kind of a weird interactive thing. This is something Roger built to solve the age-old problem of how do you convert Morse code, which is impro and the bottom right device, over the air to this signal thing so that if you do understand signals, as so many people do, but not Morse code, then you can convert from Morse code to signal flags. <laughs> well done, Roger. Here's the one where people are uh, looking at the stroke patterns of swimmers and monitoring that to learn about that. An art project involving uh, self-flocking blimps. Um, uh, this is uh, a project to have uh, Boxes in a shipment all talk to each other so that they discover one of them is being treated oddly, like being carried off, because a lot of shipments are just in unmonitored open space. And so they can talk to each other and say, hey, something's going on weird. Did you feel that bump? Um, this, this woman had a dance uh, um, as a music generator thing in, in a little ball with a sunspot. And as she dances, that dictates the rhythm of her particular musical riff going. And her friends could come and join her, and they have their little thing, and they add their riff in, and so on and so forth. So for every unique combination of people, you have a unique overlay of different musical riffs. This is one of my favorite stories. Roger will remember fondly the, rock, the rocket launch. And uh, we had these uh, spots that we were willing to sacrifice in case they kind of something went wrong with it. But these two little planes attach belly to belly and can get launched up like an amateur rockets will. And I actually didn't do much uh, on this, although I wrote some of the software that was involved at the time. I just came by and ate some pizza and watched people. But I did ask one critical question. Do you think that thing weighs too much now for it to launch off? And so they did look on the internet and find out that we had to manically run down to the hobby store and buy a larger rocket engine and come back and then drill these holes in the bottom of these rockets to jam that bigger. I, oh, this isn't going to work. But OK, it was a Friday project. It was Friday afternoon. And we were just going to go out and launch it and see how it went. So we get out to the parking lot. There were about 150 people. Word had gotten out, rocket launch in the parking lot, 3 o'clock. <laughs> and that, that would have been sort of OK, except also out there was uh, Greg Papadopoulos, the CTO of Sun, and some guys in suits from Sandia National Labs, where they make rockets. <laughs> So they were all watching this. I just thought, oh, is this going to be embarrassing? Or maybe it's like going to spiral across this and chase these poor people. Ah, the humanity, you know. But actually, it, it went great. It went up in the air. We collected all this telemetry. And uh, you could see the, 
It was a nice sunny day, so the light level stays constant. Um, and there's some, these are the accelerometer things, so you can see there's a big kick from the accelerometer, and then it coasts for a little bit. There's the ejection charge that kicks them apart, and the, this particular one comes flying back and obviously has a big spike here on the accelerometer when it lands, and then it just sits there for a little bit, and all of a sudden, the light level starts to have these sort of sinusoidal oscillations in it. What do you think that could be? <laughs> Roger knows. No, it's just like, this was after it landed, and then it's just sitting there for a few seconds. Somebody's carrying it away, and they pick it up, and they walk with their arms swinging, and it goes in shadow and light and shadow and light. And then they put it down, and a bunch of people are milling around. And So that this would be a great project about stuff in the real world, all computer-based for for kids. Um, this is a guy that, um, one of Roger's, my favorite story, missed his dog while he was at work, so he put a camera on it so he could see his dog and let people talk over the internet to his dog and say, Sadie, roll over, and Sadie would roll over. And after people started doing this, he would sort of feel sorry for it, so he uses spots to remotely instrument the dog's uh, little basket there, and you could see a metal chute that could contain dog goodies and a little lever that could dispense a goodie at the press of a button, and Sadie could go get, get that. Uh, all sorts of conventional mesh networking applications are possible in something like this. And uh, I wanted to just me briefly mention, just so it's not just about stuff I've done, this sort of stuff is going on all over the world. This is uh, over in the UK. Uh, I was an external um, reviewer on, the pr on this project, called uh, the Personal Inquiry Project, and uh, the idea is based on this idea of inquiry-based learning, which in my mind is essentially turning students into little scientists where they ask questions they care about, about the world they're in, that's their personal world. They collect data and uh, test it. Uh, they have a bunch of sensors that are out there, but again, of course, it's all connected through computer and network. They bring that data back into the classroom, they share it on a big screen, and they analyze it and uh, uh, Learn that, learn that way. So how am I doing for time? I've lost track. I'm probably going to run out soon. So I'll go very quickly. The, the, it's kind of interesting to watch how we started historically with, because of this emphasis here, and by the way, this work continues to this day. It's still good stuff going on. So that's why it's green to the right. All this stuff is continuing. But we've continued to starting kind of with ideas and then relate to our bodies with, like the computers can make us feel like we're in a place and then we get connected to people. It's kind of like this technology implication is spilled in through our brains, out through our fingers to other people, and now out finally to the physical world. So from the abstract to include more and more concrete. I'm going to end by this observation inspired by Marshall McLuhan and my friend Rob Tao put me onto the, some of this and added my own little thoughts. But in the old days, there were a way that news came about was through broadsides. And as technology evolved, they became absorbed into this idea of a newspaper where individual elements were combined. And notice that uh, this is the concept of media swallowing. And that tends to happen a lot uh, over time. It's interesting to watch. And notice that the, there's a bunch of meta elements that have been added here, like the title and uh, where contingent on page 13 boundaries between objects and stuff. So in the process of swallowing, we add these kind of meta decorations. But this always uh, happens. We go from that to that with like these meta elements of uh, lighting and boundaries. Uh, and then from that to film, and then from uh, using all sorts of different meta stuff. And then from film, we could have many films running in the same way and meta controls to change between them and adjust how they appear and so on. So in fact, it looks like all this stuff is kind of like showing up now on your computer screen, isn't it? Just this big chain of swallowing. And uh, so an interesting question, and of course there's lots of meta stuff here, buttons to uh, iconify, to resize, to reorder, to replace, and all that stuff is all about 
uh, controlling all this different stuff, which now is in this one media, the computer. So how much swallowing can go on? It's kind of interesting. Well, with it, does this, I think this is an interesting open question. Can you really fit all that into those things? <laughs> and then, then the question is, what about these little devices? What are they swallowing from before? And my claim is what they're doing is they're swallowing the physical world into a new thing, which is kind of like the super world. It's all like now made accessible to us and our control, we've overlaid it with accessibility in principle to, to us. And we've made a new thing that's the swallowed uh, physical world in the computational layer. And I leave as a final question, okay, what could swallow all this stuff? That'd be interesting. What could swallow all that stuff? But that's the end. Thank you for your attention. I forgot to show one demo. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that. This is a sunspot. And here's a little bit of geometry class. See, as I, these are the accelerometers. Which way is down? And you can see there's some sinusoidal waves forming, but they're 90 degrees out of phase. And I'm going to do that again, but I'm going to attach this to the bottom of a frisbee and ask somebody in the far corner to catch a frisbee. Back there. You're the farthest. Volunteer to get hit in the head with a frisbee. Let's see if this works. I have not tried this. <laughs> I really have not tried this for a long time. <laughs> uh, well, hey, how about a new demo in which you throw it back? <laughs> <laughs> So you could see these, there's the oscillation rate, and there's the run of uh, the throw. And uh, here it is at rest, sitting around, you know, after it was caught. So uh, you could do some experiments to see if you could throw over a fixed distance at different oscillation rates, and maybe get it to stay up longer by throwing it faster. You want to try again? Uh, okay, one, two, three, go. And that, that was not a high spinning thing. And it <laughs> was kind of at an angle or something. Kind of tilted more and more. All right. Questions? If any. Oh, I'll get it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the, the Kansas interface is actually the interface to the self-language that comes with it. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the ability to reprogram things dynamically on the run. I don't think we did that during the test with students, um, but I think that's a great way to program in general. Um, you could, you know, reprogram things in the world itself because you get immediate feedback and you could see how they're working and all that stuff as you go. Now, I'll just make a side comment that what happens when you make an error that causes the world ability to display itself crash? Because you could do that by programming things bad enough. And so for Kansas, I introduced this other layer called Oz. And when things get troublesome in Kansas, you get thrown into Oz, everybody together, and we have an emerald debugger, and you all travel, you could work together to debug the problem, and then when it's solved, you can resume your life in Kansas below. And there's an article in CACM on that. I could point out to anyone that's interested. <laughs> Any other? Right. Yeah. Um, so these are accessible for your programmability very readily. They come with an, um, uh, a radio on there that you totally control for mesh networking and stuff locally. Um, 
and uh, you can't call home or anything on these. But um, and you could, you know, you can a easily access. Uh, there's uh, pins on there for accessing and controlling current to outside things like servo motors and stuff like that. Is there anything else you would say? Yeah, you get to program it and you get to control the radio as you wish and uh, you can uh, control external devices. Uh, Cost-wise, what is our price nowadays? 300 for a kit? Yeah, yeah. Little, yeah. I think so. Yeah, right. The the sun, yeah, sunspotworld.com. I should should advertise that, but just look up Sunspot World on the web, and um, they're through the Oracle store. You can you can order those. Um, and I think Pei, who had to go for a, a lecture, is doing all the sensor stuff here with helicopters, little toy helicopters and stuff, and has classes that still use sense, uh, sunspots. So they're they're lurking around the building here somewhere. More any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Looks familiar. Gosh, Park. <laughs> but I don't. I don't think I knew you there. But I don't think you ever left. I met you at all. Yeah. Right. We have several connections. You you're still playing with the octopus. Jeff, right? Yeah. I didn't know you. I'm a trombone player. Play with the audio. Oh, all right. Okay, great. I was at your uh, box gig. Uh, oh, yeah. Two weeks ago. Both right. my buddies on the left side of the street. Oh, good. Yeah. And physics. Yeah, they're good. Physics and physics. Oh, you are? Cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I wish you could come up at the, at the club box. But anyway. Yeah, I took off. Um, you know, your first thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just shut this off. So, are, so you're playing now, huh? Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm only with the daddy regularly, but you know, it's, it's sitting. I think it's sad when them once or twice, but that that's about it. Yeah. And then how about the physics? How are you able to do physics and get paid? Uh, I don't <laughs> oh, I see. I have a little nonprofit. Uh huh. I do Britney's consulting gigs. And, uh huh. But um, we have a. Uh, a small nonprofit uh, dedicated foundation to physics at the GP Langley Institute. Oh, called Boundary Institute. And it's uh, undistracted by major funding. Uh huh. <laughs> hey, I've got a. I'm trying to sell a project. I'd like to be able to work on it for a year. It's a way to. I have a theory for a way to teach an intuition for relativistic space time. And I think I can make a collaborative environment that has two regions. But you know, in physics, all these paradoxes like the clock paradox. Do you know the Nobel in the balance paradox? Or someone the law in the balance paradox? Oh, special relativity. Yeah, right. Time doesn't fit in. It doesn't fit in. Yeah, like for the for the guy with the holder, the farm is basically the same thing. And for the barn, it's like it's the same thing. So the time yeah, yeah. barn agent left the door is attracting the sun. Okay. The guy's right hand is going to the clock table. How does that result? So my theory is that if you use plane degrees in time, it's really just a relativistic clock for knowing what time it is. Now, if you were to play against that barn agent, ring off and start clock, you can actually you get a sense for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that would be a lot of fun. I've got a, yeah. I've got a new group of Special relativity. Oh yeah, from um, from uh, from counting. From counting, <laughs> that's pretty. From, from differences in counting. So I'll tell you, the guy who says I can count. <laughs> oh, great. 
Yeah, that'd be great. <clears throat> so, um, uh, can you send me an email or can I send you a memo email address or a card? <laughs> great, that's good enough. Website trying to kind of do a civil engineering story. Yeah, I just, you know, I'd like to. Uh, Learning about living in a different world around them. So I'd love to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> 